Okay. Um, so we'll start the lecture today, finishing off a few of the topics we had from last week. Um, so we finished last week more or less with these morphological ideas of opening and closing. And we had a few specific use cases where they come in quite well. I'll make this full screen. Um, so as kind of a quick review on those topics, we had a sort of the idea of opening where we take extraneous pixels and delete them so that you have the pixels before and the pixels afterwards and those areas are removed. And closing where you had sort of holes or gaps in your image and you used um, morphological operations to fill those up. And so where this actually comes in handy is with a sample like this, where we have sort of a bone sample, and we'd like to know what the air fraction is inside of this bone. And so there is, for us, a very clear boundary to this bone, but it's not immediately obvious how you would actually count the pixels that are inside there. And so there's a number of different approaches you can take. One of the easiest things to do is sort of erosion or dilation. And that's where we can perform the closing operation and start to fill in those holes. And so we don't add area outside the bone, but we add area inside the bone. Of course, to close the larger holes, it's more difficult. And so we have to use a much larger kernel or a much number a uh, larger number of iterations in order to get that completely closed. And so we end up with um, sort of excess area around the border that isn't part of the bone sample itself. And so we end up with these kind of artifacts because of this edge effect that we talked about last week. So of course, different kernels give us different results. So as we showed, there's a number of different sort of neighborhoods you can use or kernels or structure elements, depending on what you're doing. Um, and each of those will end up giving you a slightly different bone fraction at the end. And the important part to note here is really that there is sort of a variance. And so if you're comparing samples and your samples, you know, are healthy at 48.5 and unhealthy at 49, then your post-processing is incredibly important because that's easily the difference that you're seeing due to the post-processing, not necessarily due to differences in your samples. Um, there's, of course, alternative techniques, convex hull, and that's where you sort of assume you have a convex shape, and then flood filling, where you connect all the pixels that are connected together. So for those of you who use Microsoft Paint, you have the Paint Bucket tool, and that sort of fills in the whole region that's connected together. So we had this with segmenting fossils, um, surface area perimeter, and that was really it for those slides. But just as sort of a quick review of what we were doing before. Oh no. So now on to the slides for this week. And so this is really continuing on the basic segmentation things we had before and moving on to more advanced techniques that we can use. So there's different references for this. Um, these are all fairly advanced reading. Uh, but if you're interested, they'll give you a lot more detail on sort of the basis for these approaches and why we use them. Um, in terms of the outline, um, and we'll potentially deviate this for a little bit, um, we'll have the kind of motivation. So many samples, difficult samples, training and learning, um, what some thresholding methods that are automated are, and so how we can apply them. Uh, this idea of sort of feature vectors, where we'll use um, more sort of machine learning representations of images, so in this ta table form rather than just a matrix, and sort of how that feeds into super pixels and beyond. And then some ideas with contouring, and so that problem that came up at the end of the lecture last week of how you actually go about finding the boundary of this bone, we'll go into more detail with. So yeah, so again, what we sort of looked at before, 
first lectures were sort of image acquisition and representation, and then enhancement and noise reduction, and we'll get back to some of those ideas today. Um, understanding models and interpreting histograms, and then sort of ground truth and ROC curves. And so um, last week, what we specifically covered in more detail was this idea of choosing a threshold. So when you look at a histogram, how can you pick a threshold for this value? Um, and then improving the segmentation, and then some of the things to be concerned about, like partial volume effect. And so one of the areas where segmentation fails is this inconsistent illumination problem. And so that's where you end up with this sort of same exact cell image, but you have different illuminations. And so if you're using a light bulb in the background, you know, you have the 60 hertz or 50 hertz, I guess, in Europe pattern that comes in. So if you take your images too frequently, if you at the top of the curve, it might be brighter. And if you're at the bottom, it might be lower from just the power. Um, if you are dealing with light bulbs, they, you know, need time to warm up. And so if you start taking pictures before the light bulbs completely warmed up, it might not be as bright. And fundamentally, what you end up with are, you know, eight different images here of exactly the same sample with different amounts of illumination. And so when we look at the histograms in sort of this first block, we see that those histograms are all shifted. And so picking a single threshold to work for all of those samples would be quite difficult. And so yeah, if we take the example of sort of a 0.6 threshold, which is what we used before, and it worked fine, we end up with a number of different images with exactly the same threshold and very, very different volume fractions. And so here, if you just look how much of the image is taken up by cells, it ranges from 1.4 to, I think, 24 is the highest. And so clearly, this is very problematic because if we're measuring a volume fraction and we're trying to do some kind of analysis later, we 1 and 24% volume fraction are hugely different. And so this is a terrible starting point for doing any kind of further analysis. And so we need to somehow come up with a way to compensate for that. Another example where it fails is this sort of idea of canaliquid. And so here we have sort of a bone sample. We have the clearly visible cell structures. And then we have sort of small structures coming out of the side, and these are called canaliquili. But basically, they are much harder to see, and trying to segment them is very difficult. And so if you want to sort of find the bone structure, or the, the cellular structures, that's fairly easy. But if you want to find the small channels that connect them together, that gets much more difficult. And so, you know, we have this partial volume effect we have noise that comes in, and so there's a number of things that make it a lot harder to actually do that segmentation. And so that's something that just picking a simple threshold doesn't do for us very well. And then kind of a, a final area where segmentation fails, this idea of sort of a brain cortex. And so this is highlighted here in red, where the cortex is barely visible to the human eye. Tiny structures might hint where this is located, but a simple threshold is insufficient for kind of labeling this cortex region. And obviously, in reality, this isn't red. This is just black and white. But the red is used to kind of show you where the cortex image might be. And that, you know, if you try to kind of do simple thresholds, here's the original image. Here is kind of picking four evenly divided points for cutting off and showing them in color over there. And that you see none of those correspond with that red region we're trying to label. And so picking a single threshold won't help us with that problem. So for the first um, few examples, one of the things that can make our life much easier is this automated, automated threshold selection. And so if you use tools like ImageJ or Fiji, this is one, when you go to threshold, this is one of the first things you see. You see all of these different items in the menu that let you pick a threshold automatically. And so um, this is entirely sort of unsupervised. And uh, for images where illumination changes, this can work very, very robustly. And so for the automated methods, 
there's kind of three different approaches we can take. Uh, the first one is the sort of histogram-based approach, where we look at the histogram, and like we did before, you kind of saw two peaks, and you then try to pick a point between the two peaks. Um, so you can use finding local minimum, you can try to find sort of the two modes, and then take the average between them. You can do sort of minimum and maximum entropy. You can perform some iterative methods. And this is sort of the Otsu isodata intermodes class of techniques that we can apply. Um, the next method, or the next sort of group of methods, is this image-based methods. And so these look at the statistics of the threshold images themselves like entropy, to estimate the threshold. And so basically you can look at the image itself in order to try to pick values that make sense. And so this would be a much more um, image-based approach rather than looking at a histogram and picking a value based on this histogram. Uh, the final kind of method is this results-based approach. And this is where you search for a threshold which deliver, delivers the desired results in the final image. Um, so this can be uh, when you know, for example, the size of your cells are between 200 and 10,000 pixels, that you can adapt your threshold and sort of iteratively go through until you find objects that are 200 to 10,000 in size. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do this. This also can be a results method driven by you have a ground truth of something you're trying to find, and you just optimize this area under the ROC curve, where you optimize the true positive rate, or F1 score, or any number of these metrics. So for the histogram methods, um, you know, if we take that typical bone slice image, we see there's sort of variations in the calcification density, and that there's two peaks that show up in the image, one at zero and one at 0.5. And so we have the image here, we have the histogram there. And we see that there's this value kind of at zero, and then there's this very broad peak at 0.5. And so trying to pick a threshold here isn't particularly easy, but given the fact there's shift space, oh, there's two peaks, it's you know probably somewhere between here and here that will differentiate well between those two groups. And so when we look at the histogram methods, there's um, sort of the three that we'll cover in a little bit more detail. So intermodes is simply taking the point between the two modes, so the two peaks in the histogram. Otsu um, searches and minimizes the intra-class, sort of within-class variance. And so what that means is that you basically come up with um, your foreground and background criteria, and what you want to do is you want to have the standard deviation within the background and the standard deviation within the foreground be as small as possible. So picking a value so that the values within those two groups are as close together as possible. And then isodata is an iterative approach where you basically pick a threshold by taking sort of the average in your image. So that formula is actually. Now that formula is correct. Um, so where you take the, the mean value, so the, or the middle value between the maximum and the minimum intensity in your image as a starting point, and then sort of iteratively go through. So while the threshold is still changing, the background is all points that are below the threshold, the object or the foreground are all points that are above, and that you take the average value in the background pixels and the average value in the foreground pixels take the sort of mean value of this, and that's your new threshold. And so as long as that threshold is different than what you had originally, you keep on iteratively updating this until it stops changing. Um, so one of the nice things about all these threshold techniques is they've been implemented a thousand times before. If you're interested, of course, you can implement them yourselves to make sure you understand the basic idea. But NIME has all of them built in. OpenCV 
has all of them built in. Scikit image has all of them built in. And one of the nice things about Scikit image is that they have this function called sort of try all threshold. And so you can put your image inside and run try all threshold and it will then show you the threshold and resulting segmentation for ISO data, we, me, minimum, otsu, triangle, yen. Um, and I think you can have it show you even more if you're interested. But that basically you get a very quick overview of what the possible thresholds would be and that they actually segment very different regions of your image. And so the ISO data seems to get this foreground background while the triangle and yen methods seem to be much more interested in these very high values of edge enhancement that you see around the objects. And so here as well, you need to be aware that when you kind of use these techniques, they may be sensitive to different things in your image. And so you don't just do this on one image, you do this on a large number of images and see that it works reliably on all of them. So in terms of kind of pitfalls, well, there's many very good use cases for it. Um, some of the techniques really require you to be very careful with what you're doing. So for the histogram-based techniques, is they're very sensitive to the distribution of pixels in your image. And so they might work really well on images with equal amounts of each phase, but work horribly on images that high have high amounts of one phase compared to the other. And so for example, if we go back um, shift. Here, here we have two very clear phases. It's easy to see in the image what's supposed to be segmented. But if we take a small subregion of this, I don't know, boom. Where there is almost no bone, so maybe. So there's no bone in this, or there's no, sorry, cellular structures in this part of the image. And so if you run that on this region, what you see is that there are, it finds something to segment. So it finds two peaks, it separates them, and it decides that one's the foreground and one's the background. While we know, looking at this image, there is only one phase, there is only bone. And so if you apply this technique on an image where there is 100% or 0% of one of the phases, then you end up with it trying to find small differences in this phase that are big enough to kind of make a segmentation with. And so while it potentially found an interesting pattern in our image, it did not find the holes in the bone versus the bone itself. And that's because it had an image that didn't have any holes in it. And so it searched for kind of the biggest difference it could find. And so that's an area where you have to be sort of very aware that if you're using these kind of threshold techniques, you'll end up with completely wrong results because it's trying to find something that actually isn't there. And so, yeah, we, that's sort of the biggest issue with the histogram techniques is that it assumes a sort of distribution. It assumes a spread. And if that isn't the case, it will figure out how to get some sort of threshold out of it. And very rarely do the techniques actually tell you this distribution looks very odd, you shouldn't do this. And this is something you need to kind of be aware of yourself. And so either set limits on what you're doing, have a good way of ensuring that images that don't end up, that don't have any holes or don't have any of one phase in them, don't end up in this method. Or often, you know, you can pick a, a threshold for a group of images at the beginning and if it doesn't fall if your current threshold doesn't fall in that range then you throw out that image as being invalid um, so image based can be sort of very sensitive to noise and large noise content in the image can change the statistics and so particularly if you're doing something that's sort of entropy based you have to be very careful with your noise levels that noise can cause that technique to fail completely and then results-based um, are sort of inherently biased by expectations. And so if you're using a technique that expects to find objects between 200 and 1,000 pixels, 
you will in all likelihood find objects of that size even if they're not in fact there because if your technique simply iterates and changes parameters until it finds that it will spit out that result um, and we have very good examples of sort of where that fails and that's particularly important when the results method is a deep neural network because these are able to do even more complicated kinds of analyses and when you give them a very clear goal to find they're very good at pretending they found that even when a visual inspection shows you that they're doing something completely nonsensical so in terms of kind of the realistic approaches because a lot of these um, techniques will not always work and it's often very difficult to test and prove that your technique is always reliable um, so one of the best ways uh, for doing this is really a model-based approach. And so this is where you try to really simulate everything that's going on in your images. And so that's what we did in one of the first slides with this illumination change. Rather than you know taking 50 images, manually segmenting them and showing that your automated threshold gets the same result, you can simply add an offset to account for the fact that each one of those images has a different illumination and then apply your technique to see if it in fact worked well. Um, it obviously doesn't cover everything and you have to be able to sort of imagine very well all the different problems your images can have. And so it requires a very careful examination of everything that's going on, but it's a fairly reliable approach that doesn't require a huge amount of effort. Um, the second is really this sort of sample-based um, where you kind of apply the methods to each sample, manually check that it worked, and keep track of what thresholds were used. And then you can apply those thresholds sort of randomly to other images and see that it still is correct enough or that there aren't problems when you do that. And so basically by taking a threshold that was generated for one image and applying it to a different one, and seeing how problematic that is for your study. Another one is kind of, or the last one is sort of this worst case scenario. And sort of come up with a worst case scenario with in terms of noise, misalignment, image quality, whatever other factors might come in, and assess how unacceptable the results are and how easy it is for you to detect that this has happened. So, you know, if you give it just a terrible quality image or an image where the light wasn't on at all, what does your system spit out and how can you be confident that that won't either massively affect your results or that you can automatically get rid of it? Um, so one of the other techniques, and this kind of goes back to the caniculi thing, is this idea of hysteresis thresholding. And so this is where you end up with images where large structures are very clearly defined and smaller structures are difficult to differentiate. And so sort of the partial of volume effect that as well. Um, there's a hysteresis threshold plugin for image J where it's sort of directly implemented but it's a fairly straightforward technique to kind of implement yourself and so here we end up with this image we had before of the bone sample we can zoom in a little bit where we have sort of the intensity values here um, with the histogram, and so this shows you how many pixels. We have this on a log scale because it makes it a lot easier to see where the different groups are, and so this is the number of pixels that fall into each group. And this is a manual kind of grouping of the pixels, where the pixels here in sort of gray are pixels that are very clearly cell or background. These pixels are somewhat in between, and so if they're touching something that's part of the holes that we're looking for, they probably are background, but if they're disconnected from it, they're probably not. And then the green values here are the ones that are very clearly um, part of the bone. And so that when you end up with these sort of groups where you're very confident about the bottom and the top, but there's this area in between that you're not so sure about, that's where you end up using an approach like the hysteresis threshold, where you can basically say, you know, this part is very clearly bone, this part is very clearly air, but some of these values in between are a lot harder to say. And so by 
we can plot that here where we have the same group shown with the green being the very clearly bone, the white being the background, and then this yellow being things that we're not sure about. And all of these values we sort of have to define manually. This doesn't combine very well with the automated approaches because you know there's not two peaks here that we're trying to separate. There's well, there's two peaks here, but there are many different places between these two peaks that we could be picking, and it requires quite a bit of looking and examining on your sample to know which one works. And so basically what we end up with is this sort of Goldilocks situation where you have sort of mama bear and papa bear. One threshold is too low and the other threshold is too high. And so here, you know, we don't get enough. We see that even this region isn't filled in. We don't get the small little structures that come out. But when we do this threshold at 110, we have way too much. And you'll find that you very often end up in situations like this where neither sort of the lower the higher thresholds make sense and that you in fact want something in between. And so of course you can always try to do sort of opening or closing on these images, but when you have this many sort of stray points, the likelihood that you can clearly differentiate between this object and this object becomes harder and harder to do. And so what we do is we try to have this kind of compromise where we have the following steps that we go through. And so the first one is you take this first very strict threshold, you then kind of clean it up a bit, because we even saw with this very strict threshold, there are still some random points that we are not interested in. You then sort of take the second threshold with the higher value, you combine both of the images, and you then keep the between pixels. And so what we define that as is the pixels that are connected to the first, so the more strict one when we remove the objects, and from the second. So we have the second image, and we only include parts of the second image which are touching parts of this image. And so what that looks like is that you have sort of your original threshold, you remove your small objects, you then have your looser threshold, and then both thresholds overlaid on top of each other, and then your connected thresholds. And so basically you grow this into this. And so anything in this that's not connected to here will be removed. And so now you can see we start to get these little canicular structures that are coming off the cells without getting a huge amount of the noise in the background. And so um, obviously this isn't a perfect example because this is coming from real noisy data, but it's sort of the start of how you would actually go about segmenting these little structures. And if you were trying to count you know, how alive is this cell or how many of these little structures come out, you can begin to do that. Um, this is also very useful when you're looking at things like fractures in bones and that often fractures sort of show up If we look at this image again, they show up as sort of almost barely visible darker lines across the sample. And of course to see that there's a fracture is interesting and useful and a nice kind of qualitative assessment. But what we're really interested in doing is segmenting, measuring how big the fracture is, measuring you know the number of fractures, the orientation, where it goes through. And that requires sort of techniques like this where we can say, this is our basis, or this is the points we're completely confident about, and these are the points that we're less confident about, but if they're close enough, we can include them in what we're doing. And yeah, the, the implementation of this is fairly straightforward, where you basically just perform, so this betweenness assessment that we do, it's easier if we do it this way, we just perform a dilation on that, um, sort of more strict image. So we start off with the remove small objects. We then perform a dilation on that, so we grow it out. And then we take that looser threshold image and cut everything off that isn't in the looser threshold image. And so we perform this a number of times. You could obviously make this technique a little bit smarter so that it checked to see if the image was changing. But this is uh, 
a very simple approach where you kind of just perform this dilation in a repeated manner in order to see sort of where those two objects are connected. This is also quite efficient because sort of you don't have to come up with a new dilation command and you don't have to go through the image point by point in order to try to grow it. Um, so if we look at kind of more complicated images, um, many measurement techniques produce sort of quite rich data. So, you know, digital cameras produce three channels of color. MRI produces dozens of pieces of information with each voxel. So depending on what sort of sequences you use and how you post-process the data, you can end up with sort of an entire tensor um, in this field called diffusion tensor imaging at each point. Um, you can also do things like MR spectroscopy where you end up with an entire spectra at each point. And so this is where, you know, if you're dealing with a 3D image and a spectra at each point, you have quite a bit of data to analyze. And this requires some new sort of techniques to work with. Uh, Raman shift imaging produces an entire spectrum at each pixel. So this was an example we went over before. Um, diffraction imaging techniques um, can produce two or three diffraction patterns at each point, and so you end up with a whole image or a whole 3D image at each point inside of your image, which is a little bit difficult to think about, but um, what you get with a lot of these data sets. And so one of the easier ways for dealing with this is sort of using this idea of a feature vector. And so this is really a pairing between spatial information position and the, uh, and the sort of value or depth in the image. And so that's kind of this original definition we had of an image. And we can use this to look at an example of sort of text on a page. And so here we end up with a text image where we can see quite clearly where the text is. So, you know, there's darker pixels and brighter pixels. There's sort of a background color and the text for us is fairly, fairly visible. And so what we would like to do is segment that text from the background. And so what we can do with this is sort of take this more um, feature vector approach where for each pixel in the image, we can say sort of here's the intensity, here's the sort of status, if it's text or not, here's the X coordinate and here's the Y coordinate. And that we can then feed directly in to sort of, you know, if we look at a histogram, we can see, okay, the intensity gives us some information that helps us decide if it's text or not. You know, the text appears to be maybe slightly higher on this scale than the non-text pixels. And then we can make an ROC curve, just like we did before, where you end up with sort of this intensity, and then you pick different thresholds in order to come up with a whole curve. And we see that just using the intensity by itself gives you this area under the curve of 0 0.82. You can now add information to this image where you, um, for example, use these edge enhancement filters that we talked about in the second lecture. And so here you can run um, a, a difference of Gaussian filters. And so here, a difference of Gaussian, you basically do a small filter on the image and then a larger filter and you take the difference. And so the idea here would be the small filter gets rid of the noise in the image and the large filter gets rid of the background. And so here we have 0.5 is sort of the small sigma for the first part and 10 is the large sigma for the back last part. And we can change these values. So if you make the first filter 0 in the last 10, then you end up with a lot sort of more noise, I guess, in your image. If you make this one, you end up not really getting rid of the background values at all. So you end up with it not kind of averaging out over enough area. But if you tweak these values, you can get it so that it does a very good job of having <coughs> the text show up in a different color than the background. And so we can continue to play, play with or optimize these values until it's 
helping us differentiate between these two groups well. And so with this value, we now see that sort of the text is blue in this image and most of the background is red versus this where we had kind of the problem that there's some blue values here and the background is a whole range of values, which makes it very difficult to decide a single cutting point for getting the right image out. So yeah, we can plot the distributions of these graphs again, where we show sort of which is text and which is not text. And we see that this is a bit more, a bit better differentiated between these two groups. We can also see that um, the uh, logs, the scale here is log, which means that even a small differentiation means there's sort of orders of magnitude more pixels in this group than there are in that group, which makes it very easy to differentiate between them. So now, if we make a ROC curve based on sort of a com combination of intensity and edges rather than just intensity or edges by themselves, we get sort of a much better result. And so that we can benefit from having multiple pieces of information that we bring together in order to make this classification. And so the whole idea of having sort of a feature vector based approach is the fact that you can take different pieces of information, combine them together, and come up with an even better result. And so it's the sort of approach you have for thinking about these problems and structuring the classification a little more clearly. So are there questions on that part? Yeah. Um, with these threshold methods, uh, how easy is it, is it to scale this up to 3D images since it's huge volumes and things of this nature? Um, well, for all the histogram-based ones, it's very easy. And the hysteresis ones as well? Hysteresis. Yeah. So the hysteresis ones work as well. Uh, you have to change, I think, where... There. Um, I think we have disk here. You need to change that to ball if you're doing it in 3D because your neighborhood isn't a 2D neighborhood anymore. Your neighborhood becomes sort of this 3D area, but that's the only thing you need to change. Of course, the biggest problem with doing 3D images is that if you have approaches like this, it takes just much longer to do every step and you have a much harder time of sort of visually inspecting it. Because if you have sort of 2,000 by 2,000 by 2,000, going through all the slices in detail is very, very time consuming. And so that, that problem sort of makes it a lot worse where, you know, this image we can try all the thresholds in, you know, a matter of milliseconds and then plot all the results on one page. With that, if you're going to do trial thresholds, it could take you 10 minutes to get the results and then you'll have to plot them and somehow visualize them and compare them. And then you'll have to try that for different samples, and so it can get quite time consuming. But fundamentally, all of these approaches apply just as well in 3D as they do in 2D. And this is also an area where um, scikit-image has invested a lot of time and energy, NIME as well, to making sure they support three, four, five, six dimensional images for all of these different operations. Um, does anyone here use OpenCV? or has used it before. Okay. Well, OpenCV doesn't support 3D images very well, and so most of the operations that are there only work in 2D. They're very fast and very well implemented in 2D, but they don't work in 3D. And so if you were deciding which tool set to use, it would be better to avoid OpenCV for 3D images because a lot of the things you'll sort of have to go implement or develop yourself where Nime, Scikit-Image, support 3D for almost everything that happens. Are there any other questions on that? If not, I think we'll take a break before the next part.